Well, welcome everyone to the panel discussion. And before we do start the panel discussion, I think it's important to thank our lecturers and thank our panelists for being here in person and making the effort, especially through these extraordinary times. And we very much appreciate um, what you've gone through, your tests, your COVID tests, and, and just the travel itself to get here um, is worth acknowledging. Thank you very much. Now, with that, we thought it was important to put together an esteemed group of panelists to challenge our esteemed group of lecturers. And I think we've done that. And, and with that, I will uh, introduce our panelists to start off with. So next to on my left is Aurora Boti. Aurora is a pediatric urologist at L'Hôpital Femme Mère L'Enfant in Lyon, France. And uh, you might recognize her name in this group because she's a frequent flyer in our top 10 reviewers award for the Journal of Pediatric Urology, and we appreciate that. And next to her award is Liam McCarthy. Liam McCarthy is a pediatric urologist in Birmingham, England. He's also a current president of the British Association of Pediatric Urologists, and he is also our um, society representative from BAPU to the Journal of Pediatric Urology Editorial Board. And next is uh, M.K. Faruja, and M.K. is a consultant pediatric urologist as well as clinical lead for pediatric surgery in Chelsea and Westminster and Imperial College Hospitals. She's also a senior lecturer in the Imperial College in London, and she's also an assistant editor for the Journal of Pediatric Urology. And finally, um, my longtime friend, Pete Hobeke. Pete is a pediatric and reconstructive urologist at Ghent University in Belgium. He also serves as dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at Ghent University, and is completing his sixth year as one of our senior editors for Journal of Pediatric Urology. So welcome, and thank you again. Now with that, um, each of our panelists have posed some questions and uh, has sent them off to our uh, lectures as well. Um, and we're going to start off, I think, with Aurora, and we'll ask Aurora to pose a question to Nicholas uh, Calfee regarding his talk from earlier today. Aurora. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Nicholas, you talked about uh, specialization in training, in pediatric urology training. Um, how do you see that happening uh, for very rare conditions that only a handful of surgeons uh, highly specialized in that should do? Like, do you think the patients should travel <coughs> around their country or around Europe to get the best care? Or do you think the teams, the expert teams, should travel so that they treat the patient in their local environment? So it's a tough question because the question is how far should reference network go to treat rare and complex conditions. So now in France, we have a network of experienced doctors. This is a rare network disease. And they provide both coordination of care and a mentoring, and they provide a multidisciplinary point of view to propose the best therapeutic approach. And the question is, in the future, um, should it be a dedicated centered to operate rare and complex disease? So, I see positive and negative points for each uh, possibility. The positive points would be, first, it could improve the outcome. And the second one is that it's going to provide a quickly increasing experience in the center. And I think the center will be able to provide more easily a multidisciplinary approach of the disease. So it, it, it will facilitate basic research, and clinical research for rare conditions, and it's going to be easier, easier to, to make large clinical studies for patients uh, if, the, if they are centralized and if they are treated in the same center. But on the other hand, we can see some negative points. And the first is the loss of experience on some, of some centers, which are uh, in quality of care for, uh, proxim <coughs> for proximity center. And it may, there may be a problem of acceptance of practitioners. And for teaching the resident, it's going to be more difficult because if they are not in the centers of, of reference, they will not be accessed to the disease and the patient. And the patients may be sometimes far from home. So it's okay if they have just a one-shot surgery, but if this is a chronic condition and the follow-up is very important, it's more difficult. So. Um, I think that pediatric urologists can move, and you, you have been a long time in Australia, and you, you know the concept of flying doctor. 
And it, it could be a good option. It could be a good op option for the patient because it will be near the home. It could be a good option for the doctor team who maintain competence and implication in the treatment and the, treatment and the care. So I think that if there's no specific material and no specific and complex follow-up, I think it's a good opportunity for the pediatricologist can move. And I think the technology we have described, especially the telementoring and teleconsultation, could be of a great help. So my answer is that as in oncology, you have authorized centers and perhaps in the future for rare and complex diseases, you, you will have approved centers and the doctors would be able to move very easily. Thank you. Very good. We'll uh, move to uh, Pete. And Pete, I'd like to ask you to uh, pose a question to uh, Dr. DeVries. Yeah, first of all, thank you for a thought-provoking lecture, I think. Um, one of the things that came into my mind is that uh, climate change provokes migration. And due to migration, we see people coming to our countries. So, uh, for instance, two weeks ago, we've seen a Syrian girl, 24 years old, with extrophy, never touched. So who, will, who has to, to take care of those adults with pediatric conditions we are seeing coming to our countries and when we go there. So who is the most apt surgeon to work on these patients? I think this is a great question because it applies not just to pediatric urology but to many conditions that children have as they grow into adults. And I think that as we are um, developing transitional care in reconstructive urology. The adult uh, reconstructive surgeons are starting to understand that they need to work with us pediatric urologists, and we also need to reach out to help them understand the problems that, that these children are born with. They're going to be, in the case of your patient, dealing with possible pregnancy. Um, I have seen this also. There are patients who I've operated on and then they come back 15 years later pregnant um, and I've been called to maternity uh, when they're about to deliver. So I think if we are a little bit more fluid in working with the reconstructive people and also uh, in the case of the, the girls, OBGYN, um, it will help to address their uh, development of sexuality, uh, their satisfaction as adults with their pediatric conditions. Excellent. Great. Um, next, I'll ask Liam to um, pose one of his questions for Nicola. So, Nicola, I'm sure we'd all agree that having a good evidence base for our practice is crucial. One of the huge attractions to being a paediatric urologist is the range of conditions we come across and treat. And sometimes these conditions are so rare that there are insufficient numbers to allow a meaningful randomised control trial to be done. How then can we improve this evidence base for the future? So, um, outcome, of the, outcome of the disease we are taking care of, the, we are treating, it's difficult to assess because of the rarity or sometimes we do not have a long view of the patients and the long-term follow-up. So to be honest, I was planning to talk at the, at the beginning in my talk about the long care follow-up as the changing phase and the challenge for pediatric urology. And I removed it because it was too long, but I should perhaps have kept it. Um, because we must stop treating just rare conditions and when, uh, on a case by case by case per case uh, basis. So it's a, real, it's a real challenge, but I think that we have some tools. And the first one is a collaboration and permanent discussion that we can have with adult urologists. Because if the cases are rare, we need a long-term follow-up to answer the question. And, and this is true even for frequent conditions, in fact. For, in, for instance, I, after the talk <coughs> I have with my um, adult urologist, personally I do not uh, operate on isolated curvature of the penis because they prefer to do a, a, a correction after puberty when everything is finished, the cross has, has finished, and all the skin. So, 
I think that the collaboration is very important because you can get information in rare disease too at a long-term follow-up. And this collaboration can come from discussion, from a joint meeting, but also joint staff. So it's very important. Um, the second point is the creation of a register. And congenital birth defect register has already effective in several countries. In France, they, are function, they function, they, they are used by region. And in some countries, it's a, at the world country level, especially in Nordic countries. And you have the European uh, network and the European register of congenital defects, which is called Eurocat. And this kind of register can provide an answer for rare conditions. Um, but besides these conditions, I think that we might get organized to create registers specific to rare urologic conditions. And we have to discuss between us, between societies, between continents, to organize that. But it's going to be sometimes quite difficult. And I think we have two other options to answer your question regarding a rare disease. The first one is the existence of national care computerized system. And especially in France, you have a, a computer system, a huge, da huge database, where you have everything, the disease, and all the conception of healthcare system for the whole life of the individual. I mean, all consultation, all treatments, and things like that. So you may get an access to long-term follow-up for rare disease through this national database. And the last option we may have is the social networks that have been proposed. So they offer a unique opportunity to find some people which, who are outside the health system. But uh, you know that we have some limitations. Confidentiality. It's very difficult to have objective data because we do not have access to the medical chart at the beginning of the treatment. And we may have a response bias because it's not the whole population you want to study and only the person, the people who are going to respond. But, but it can bring to us new items we would not have imagined to evaluate the long-term outcome for our disease. Excellent. So if I am putting together some themes from all of this, and if there was a common thread, and there were several, but one common thread between the two talks from earlier today is that as pediatric urologists moving into the future, we need to broaden our scope on disease of children. We need to bring in multidisciplinary teams uh, to help, uh, both from long-term care of our own patients, but also the other peripherally related concepts of dealing with children in a more holistic fashion and not so much focusing on that hypospadias that we see right in front of us. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I think we have MK. Uh, I'm posing a question for Catherine, if you don't mind. Thank you for an eye-opening talk. So um, as you mentioned, one of the positive outcomes of the pandemic was the use of Zoom and other platforms for international learning. And um, I was part of a team of international colleagues, in particular in South and Central America, that organized um, difficult case discussions, educational evenings for trainees worldwide. But most of the trainees came from Central and South America. And we did this twice a month throughout uh, 2020. And we had four to 500 trainees attend. And we thought a wonderful way to be able to share our knowledge to trainees who normally can't get access. Now, my question was going to be, would the technology be there in low and middle income countries to be able to organize this? But you also mentioned that they do tend to have phones. So is this something we could take take on, just try and at least share knowledge or teach via these platforms? Absolutely. I think that that is really going to be key, especially to long-term engagements. So it's one thing to go visit, but very few people from the global north can afford to <coughs> go and stay in other places for a long time. Our departments tend to be small and they uh, don't really uh, they're not happy about us leaving for long periods of time. So uh, repeated short engagements are good, but they're expensive, and it's hard to do it. And there's quite a lot of basic knowledge and also case discussion that can be done, just as you've already been doing. Um, in, in Latin America, I believe also uh, would and could happen in Africa, 
but they, they do have some problems even with cell phones and those ha have to do with networks that are a little bit um, shaky in some places. Hospitals, sadly, have worse connections than people have in their own homes. And it's hard to get trainees to uh, get together, for example, in a hospital because the investment has, has been pretty weak, especially in public hospitals. But that doesn't mean they haven't taken matters into their own hands and gotten their own networks. And in people's private homes, you could probably get more attendants for trainees uh, because they'll invest in themselves and they invest in their own education. And, and I think that um, if we were to do this uh, on a much broader basis, it would be great. It's happened all in the States also during COVID. There was, uh, among many, many universities, there was a rotation of faculty that spoke on different subjects. That happened there. I was not aware of yours, but I think we could probably institutionalize this around the planet, and especially for people who speak different languages as their primary, uh, that there are probably enough well-trained faculty to serve that need. Very good. I'm going to reverse the order a little bit just to change things up, and I'm going to ask Aurora to uh, pose a question to Catherine again so that you don't have a rest. <laughs> yeah, thank you for, for this amazing talk. Um, continuing on surgeons' education or training, how can we best tailor uh, the, the training of surgeons in low- and middle-income countries? Because we see some of them coming for fellowships in high-income countries full of technology. And I always wonder what they really take off from that. Do they really benefit from it? Because then they go back to their countries where they can't use what uh, they've seen, really. I, I think this is a great question, and I hear it often. I take the point of view that our colleagues are intelligent, creative, people who will find ways to make things work. They can adapt what they have already. Uh, they may have relatives in other countries that can get them things they need. Uh, they can fabricate things. And I've seen people look at a retractor. They couldn't buy the retractor, so they make a retractor. They know what they want, and they've had the opportunity to see how it works and then they can create something that works in their system. So I think some things are harder to create than others, um, but some things can be easily adapted once you see what it is you want. So I, I really do like the idea of bringing people from low resource countries to see what a well-functioning system looks like, and then they can go back and work on that and it's not easy in their own places. Good. Pete, back to you. Yeah. Um, for Nicholas. So Nic for Nicholas, yes. So, Nicholas, you've shown us that technology will determine the future of pediatric urology. But I have a question about affordability of the technical development. Uh, is there no point where cost and um, progress come into conflict? Yes, this is a major question because it brings us back to the reality of our hospital and the cost and the effectiveness of the technology. And this is especially true for pediatrics because we do not have a lot of cases as in adult surgery. So the question of the cost is very important. And I think that the, the issue of the cost of the progress is a recurrent, recurrent question. And we have two visions that clash. On the one side, the progress and individual benefit whatever the cost, and on the other side, the purely economical approach. As, as I said, we've done a review <coughs> about uh, evidence-based medicine and technology, and the results were quite disappointing, disappointing. So I understand that the question uh, of the cost is relevant. So uh, the Royal College of Surgeons did a great text about the progress of surgery, and I, I read it, and the word cost is repeated 36 times. So it's, the problem is, is real. And they perfectly summarize the situation. They say, I cite the report, many of the complex specialized inter interventions described 
are likely to have initial high costs due to the rarity of skills and equipment involved and low economies of scale. Undoubtedly, cost will be a barrier to development and adoption of some innovations. The healthcare system is increasingly, increasingly under pressure for funding, with often competing spending priorities. The current drive for efficiency-driven savings is unlikely to disappear, but it risks the health system missing out on improvement in health patient care. Innovations need to, be, to demonstrate cost effectiveness as well as clinical effectiveness if they are to be adopted across the healthcare system. So this is definitely true. This is true, but I'm not sure it should be like that because we are going to miss opportunities. We are going to slow down the innovation and it's going to create inequities before, between countries and between, inside the countries between the private and the public system. And it does not take into account the long-term savings such as uh, prevention and genetics. So cost is inherent to progress and it should be considered as an investment. And I'm not sure that the field of health as the field of uh, environment pro pro protection should be cost effective. I'm not sure. This is a vast question on the different health systems in the world, and I am not an economist of health, but I'm not sure it is up to the pediatric urologist to demonstrate and to prove the cost effectiveness. It, it's, it's, this is not our job. Our job is to improve care, to push the boundaries of medicine, and perhaps we should let health economists and government take responsibility. Thank you. Very good. Um, Liam, I think you're up next. Question I have for Catherine. Um, surgery has an important role for healthcare in low and middle income countries. A simple hernia repair has been described as having the biggest long-term personal and economic benefits for patients in their society. What specific paediatric urological procedure might have the biggest health benefit in the low middle income country setting? <laughs> you, you remember in my talk I showed a picture of the World Bank um, essential surgery book. We went round and round about what would be pediatric urology, and they finally decided that pediatric urology didn't rate among the top operations as hernias did. So, but if I were to pick a pediatric one, I would say that um, that hypospadias because of the numbers, because it's so common and because it's so devastating to patients and their families. Um, you only have to see the families themselves and the patients to recognize that if that care is not available, it can shoot a whole family's dreams of their progeny down. Um, this is a social thing um, rather than uh, an essential surgical care problem. But I think we can't say that I think it's very difficult to put an economic number, for example, how much uh, work is lost, uh, which is a measure for hernias, for example, for somebody who has one. It's very hard to look at problems with DSD and measure the uh, financial impact of, of that social problem, but if you talk to people about how it impacts their future lives together, their sexuality, their marriage possibilities, those are not trivial. Um, and I think that probably is the easiest one we could approach. Can I chip in that point? Um, I go to Africa and have been going to Africa for the last six years. And mm -hmm. actually, I do a lot of hyperspadius repairs there. Mm. And it's amazing how every time I go back, and I go back to the same place every time, there are more people queuing around the block to see me. Yes. So although it may not be something that people may regard as an absolutely essential thing, I think the future fertility and marriageability of their children is such a profoundly important thing that this has a high priority for them. Agree. 
I'm going to take the liberty of piggybacking a question onto that and challenge it just a little bit. Okay? <laughs> and my challenge is, how do we balance the expertise of the volunteers with the actual needs of the community? And there's a term that's thrown around quite a bit. And maybe they come to you to do the hypospadias because you come to do hypospadias. Oh, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. There's a term that's thrown around quite a bit that I have trouble reconciling with, and that is volunteerism. Volunteerism, meaning that many who do this type of work see the benefit to them, don't they? Mm -hmm. They see they can put it on their CV. They can talk to medical students about it and get them engaged. There are lots of benefits to the volunteer, isn't there? But the benefits of the community are not always appreciated, or the needs of the community are not always appreciated. So I'm just going to throw that out, and um, I'll, du I I'll duck. I'll yeah. duck. <laughs> <laughs> not until I remember. <laughs> go ahead, please, go ahead. Well, I, I think that um, volunteerism uh, is, is almost a reprehensible activity if it's a one-off that you, you hit and run, also called parachute medicine. Yep. You know, there, uh, it is, um, it has come in for a lot of flack in global surgery in general. On the other hand, the opportunities to engage with a community and especially, and this is where I think the value is, if we're working with people who are training others, so I have always uh, chosen to go to places that are teaching institutions and to work with people who are in a position to train others. And I believe that if we invest in training the trainers, then we can build capacity, whereas although it's not bad to help a few patients, it's not necessarily good in the long term. And you have the potential for having complications that won't be managed. I think that's a good answer. If anyone wants to read more about that, by the way, there's a great book that, um, that, I, that I'll show you. It's called um, Hoping to Help the Promises and Pitfalls of Global Health and Volunteering, which I think addresses a lot of these issues, but I think addresses it in a very balanced way uh, also by uh, Judith uh, Lasker. Okay. MK, you're up. Um, so my question is to Nicola. Um, so I was really fascinated by uh, your 3D printing models in order to plan reconstructive surgery. Um, and having, having kind of re reviewed your talk, I was just asking around our Imperial College colleagues who are very into kind of medical technology. And they're doing a project on using Microsoft HoloLens, so augmented reality designs, which are digital, so can be shared between um, centers. So two level questions. One is, have you got any experience? Is there any established pediatric urology models we could share? And secondly, is it applicable to fetal urology? Can we use it to develop techniques for fetal intervention? So um, thank you very much. It's a very nice question. And HoloLens is a great device, so I'm not an expert in Microsoft HoloLens. I think it's a fantastic technique. So we have three levels of reality, the virtual reality. Everything is virtual. The augmented reality, you have ad images that are added on the reality, but the main thing remains the reality. And the mixed reality, where you have both virtual and real object, and you can manipulate both of them, and this is exactly what, what HoloLens is. So at the beginning, I was very excited by HoloLens because they, it was developed with Kinect, which is a device that uh, track your head movement for the Xbox playing system. Mm -hmm. And 10 years ago, I had an Xbox playing system, so I was waiting my HoloLens to play. <laughs> but it did not come. It did not come. And, and you know that the, the 3D printing is another way to do what HoloLens does perhaps better. It, it aims to reproduce the manipulation of the organ to better, to better understand the problem. So the HoloLens goes further. It allows the manipulation of both real and virtual objects probably is very promising because it's faster, it's more adaptive. And to take the example of fetal urology, uh, regarding vesicoamniotic shunt, I did not find any very recent technique except you, those you have described in your paper last year. And regarding the, the cystoscopy, so this is a work I cited. It's very interesting because I did MRI of fetuses 
both normal fetuses and fetuses with low lower urinary tract obstruction. They did 3D printing and they, did com they compared the angle between the bladder and the ureter, the, the ure urethra, and they showed that the angle was not the same. So they developed a specific fetoscope with a rotor motor that can deploy with a right angle and to have a nice view. And this is typically the application of 3D printing or HoloLens. Aurora, I think you're up next. Um, Catherine, do you think that l surgeons in low and middle income countries do have to go through all the same development steps that we went through? Like for instance, we went from open surgery to laparoscopic procedures. Do you think that there are shorter ways for them and they can use our experience? And even though, for example, the, um, the cost at the beginning is higher, then we know that it decreases complication rate, hospital stay, uh, post-operative pain. Do you think that might be a better option for them to go straight to laparoscopic procedures, for example? Well, I think that open surgery is good for everyone to know. It's um, shocking to me that there are people who finish training who have never done an open nephrectomy or, or a partial nephrectomy. I mean, I think this is basic knowledge that we all should have because it doesn't always work out in every circumstance that laparoscopy uh, can be done. And if you come up upon a problem, it's good to know how to fix it. Um, that said, I think laparoscopy has a real place in low resource countries, uh, possibly more in adult surgery than in pediatric urology. Uh, and possibly more in p general pediatric surgery. But we have seen in Mongolia, and I work very closely with our team at Utah, uh, where they have been teaching uh, lap cholecystectomy. And patients can come in same day, have it done, go home in a few hours, whereas previously it was a five-day stay with possible complications. This is a real advance for people who uh, can't afford to stay, uh, who need to get back to work. In the case of kids, it's a little less clear where the place is and the value is. Um, I think we push some of this technology harder in the United States because patients have learned to expect it. But the actual value to the patients, it's sometimes hard for me to tell whether a very small incision for something that could be done in half an hour open and have the same measured outcome is an advantage over the cost of doing it that way. And that gets even amplified if you consider robotics. But I do think laparoscopy is a great way to start. Many, minimally invasive surgery, I think, has great potential. I would start with cystoscopes, honestly. That's a, people don't have these. They're hard to get, they're very expensive, they need to be maintained, and those are fundamental to everything we do. I'd start with those scopes and then go for the laparoscopes. Pete. Well, maybe a, a bigger question for Catherine and eventually for Nicolas. Um, you've shown us a nice picture of trash behind the hospitals, mm -hmm. but of course, if you look at the world, there's a lot of pollution, mm -hmm. um, in all kinds of pollution. And I believe it influences our practice, uh, endocrine disruptors. Do you believe that the same disparity between low-income countries and high-income countries exists for the effects of the negative uh, environment? Or is this a worldwide problem? I think the impact is worldwide, and I think the impact is greater in low-resource countries. But in terms of contribution, I think that mostly comes from the higher income countries and then for big countries like China that has you know, a lot of coal-fired power plants and things like that. Um, it is true that waste management is poorly done in low resource countries, all kinds of waste, biomedical waste, uh, but they don't have, for example, the radioactive waste that we do and from all of our hospitals, we, we have quite a lot of that. Uh, there are no systems in place in many uh, low resource countries, even for dealing with the uh, nuclear medicine waste that we 
consider routine. We don't even think about it, you know, all the studies that we do. Nicholas, any comment? Um, the, the, the climate change and the pollution, as you said, is a global problem, but I think that the global north, as you said, is the main product, producer, producer of pollution. And there, there's a report in The Lancet last year by a Harvard team who reports that 4% of gas emission is due to the health system. So definitely we can improve this by best, better waste management, reusable devices, and all the technologies I, I spoke about is a huge consum consumption of energy and a data exchange through the web, which is a significant source of pollution. Um, and this pollution and the endocrine disrupting chemicals may slightly change what we are going to see because uh, we, we will have more and more prematurity and perhaps congenital defect. But beyond that, there's going to be new pathologies in adult surgery as endocrine, autoimmune, respiratory. And the risk is that there's a new distribution of health resources. And it could be at the, at the expense of pediatric urology. So I think that the climate change and pollution may be a danger for our future, future, future plans in pediatric urology. Okay. Liam, I think you're up. Yeah, Nicholas. Uh, your talk was fascinating and very forward-looking. My question is about looking backwards. Many of the conditions a paediatric urologist manages involve surgery in infancy, and it may, may only be when that person reaches adulthood or even middle age that the true outcomes of the intervention become clear. Sometimes it feels as if we're engaged in a very long-term experiment. How would you suggest that surgeons in the future learn from their predecessors given that some of these outcomes are happening only now and others are still gestating. So it's a question, finally, which is quite different from your previous one because your previous question was about rare and complex disease. But this is finally perhaps almost the same answers we can provide. How can we get information for very long-term outcome of something we are doing in the early infancy? We, we, stop, we should stop treating children. We are ch treating children in the, in the becoming, in the making, into adults. So how to get long-term outcome? As I said, this is registers. And you know that we had a presentation at the last CSPU by Katy uh, Herbst and Darius Bagley, who remind us at, which, at what point the registers are the allies of pediatric urology, uh, urologists. And I think this is a good option. So we might try to get organized to do some high quality pediatric urology condition re registers. And for that, we have to define conditions. We might benefit from that. And this is mainly those who need to be followed up for a long time, such as bladder extrophy, reflux, DSD, and things like that. And the other point is that we have to define the right question at the right moment to evaluate the register. And this is quite difficult because we do not have this information. So the registers is an option, but it's not so easy to, to organize, especially when registers are between countries because we do not have all the same regulation and laws. And it's sometimes difficult to organize when health data of one individual is stored in another country. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. So the registers um, and the, the, the collaboration, as I said, with adults and perhaps again uh, the social networks. But I think that registers is the main answer to your question. MK, I'm going to turn the question over to you to pose, and I'll give you the option. You can, uh, you can uh, hit a, either one of our uh, lecturers. Actually, I, have, I wanted to pick up on a point that Nicolas said, if I may. So, <laughs> sorry. So back to the cost discussion. And you mentioned that cost is an R issue and it should kind of be something that for the authorities and the governments to, cha to challenge. So we've been through that process trying to build up a robotic service in our centre. And, you know, being run by the NHS, which is a na national health service, um, their answer back in summary is that if it can be done cheaper, open or laparoscopically, why do we need to invest in a robot? Because we're not going to make any money. And that's a very, very difficult, um, it's, a, it's a very difficult argument to fight back. 
So what I think, I mean, we managed to get it in the end, but through charity work and kind of getting funding from pharmaceutical companies. So what I think is now happening in higher income countries is that areas where there's privatized care are packed with robots and innovation and what can be done should be done, like you said. Whereas in other places like the UK, um, we're struggling, even though theoretically we're a higher income country, we're struggling to get that technology. Do you have any suggestions on how we can approach our authorities to let them deal with the cost? <laughs> Oh, thank you very much for, for your question. I'm afraid I, I will not bring you the definitive solution <laughs> to your problem. I, I would love. No, so, so to begin, we have to be honest. Uh, robotics has not definitely proven it's necessary in pediatric technology and pediatric surgery. And perhaps we could consider that the approach should not be for pediatric technology only, but we should approach robotics as a scale of the world institution or all other disciplines, because the more case you are doing, the less the cost will be. This is the first thing. The second point is that we are waiting for the next generation of robotics, and savings are about to be minus 25%. And we are also, uh, we, we, will, we will see the arrival of new uh, manufacturers, and again, it's going to drop the cost. And the more the cost is going to be, to be democratized, the more the cost is going to go down. So for, for instance, in France, we have 12 to 13 robots which are used for pediatric urology. Um, and we are doing around 200, 220 cases per year. And as you said, in England, you have two or three very active robots. But in fact, the differences in the number of cases is not so huge because it's a different way of doing you are concentrating the technology and the cases that can benefit from that. So we, we could have asked the same questions for all the progresses. For instance, why coagulation and why harmonic scalpel? Because our knotting was, were very effective and they were very cost effective. Another exam, example is the laparoscopy because laparoscopy had the same criticisms some decades ago. And I can do a, a new analogy with aeronautics. Now our planes are glass cockpits, but our regular compass was, were working very well and they were very cost effective. So regarding the robotic, I have no definitive answer and I have not the solution, but I think that the progress has to, to go through this difficult step. Good. I'm certainly getting the sense that this could go on for many more hours. <laughs> I think the discussion has been great, but unfortunately, we're going to have to, uh, to wrap it up soon. And, and in that regard, I do want to first uh, thank Pete and MK and Liam and Aurora for being here and participating in this panel and for your great questions. Uh, special thanks to Catherine and Nicola for their wonderful presentations today and for surviving our questions as well and putting up with us. Um, a special thanks also goes out to the journal company for sponsoring this lectureship and this first inaugural JPU lectureship. You've certainly set the bar pretty high for future lectures. There's no question about that. Uh, but uh, our hats go off to a wonderful um, job today. Um, a special thanks to Aaron and our crew from the uh, media services in order to pull this off as well. We appreciate your cooperation and all your expertise. Uh, and finally, a real special thanks goes out to Stephen, Stephen Griffin. Um, the amount of work that he's put in to pull this meeting off, to pull the editorial board meeting off, as well as the first lecture, you can't imagine the hours that he's put in for this. And the, I think you did get some more gray hairs, I'm not so sure, <laughs> in the process. But a very, very special thank you. And with that, I think we'll conclude the session.